to my left is Wolfgang Grein Vector, professor for international communication policy and regulation, University of Aarhus. Um, then um, Mr. Paminda Jishin, he is the well the direct executive director of IT for Change, if I'm not mistaken, from India. And then um, Melvi Kutamana Kutama, I'm sorry. Um, she is Councillor Information Society and Trade Facilitation of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland, uh, Department for External Economic Relations. Last but not least is Marcus Kummer. No introduction. <laughs> Everybody should know him. Or now with ISAC, Vice President for Pu Public Policy. Um, with that, uh, if I may, I'd like to ask Peter for some 10-15 minutes to give you the setting the scene. Afterwards, there's no structured anything, but we'll just discuss among all of us. So, Peter. Well, good morning. After this introduction, I uh, go straight into the heart of the matter. Uh, I will give you some kind of background information about the uh, CSTD Working Group on Improvements to the RGF and uh, the recommendation. The CSTD stands for the uh, commission, on, commission on Science and Technology for Development, which is a commission of the uh, Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Uh, in this uh, short presentation, I'll try to give some background, uh, the mandate and the composition of the working group, uh, some words about the meetings, uh, about the agreed main topics, uh, what were the results and the recommendations, uh, some words about the follow-up and conclusion. Uh, there was a long debate about the, uh, naturally about enhanced cooperation. Uh, and of course, as it happened, uh, always uh, we couldn't come to an agreement within the CSCD. So it was decided to set up a working group on what? On improvements up to the RGF. So uh, there was a proposal from the CSCD in May 2010. It was approved by the ECOSOC in its resolution also in 2010, July. It was endorsed by the General Assembly. And uh, the time was so short that uh, the mandate had to be extended to 2012. So what was the mandate? during the uh, zero, uh, day zero, I mentioned that we always try to adhere to the mandate we were given. Uh, uh, this mandate was to, uh, for the CSTD to establish an, in an open and inclusive manner a working group which should seek, compile and review inputs from all UN member states and all other stakeholders on improvements to the IGF with the aim to give recommendations for improvements without changing basic features of the RGF. That is, it is multi-stakeholder in character and it's not a decision-taking forum. And finally, uh, the working group was supposed to give a report to the CSCD in May 2011, uh, which uh, was partially fulfilled. Uh, but before going to, into these details, let me give you uh, some notion about the composition of the working group, which was uh, a multi-stakeholder approach. So uh, basically it was composed of uh, 15 member states of the CSTD, who are members of the CSTD, and in addition to that uh, there were two countries, organizing countries for the WISIS summits, Switzerland and Tunisia, and uh, we started the six organizing countries uh, uh, well, five organizing countries for the RGF, uh, but as uh, time went down, we had uh, another organizing country, Kenya, which was included also in the working group. So altogether we were 
there were 23 states. Uh, we had five, five business representatives, five academia, five civil society, and five from the international organizations. The working group first was chaired by Mr. Frederick Reel from Switzerland, and uh, I believe already in Vilnius, uh, during the IGF, there were some preparatory meetings followed up in the ITU, uh, also alongside with the business uh, forum uh, consultative meetings. And we had our first meeting in Montreux in February, uh, which was characterized by a perfect mistrust from all parties. Uh, people uh, were extremely anxious. Uh, they didn't really know uh, why the other party was there. So apparently they couldn't understand that it was a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, we had our second meeting uh, in March, just one month afterwards, and uh, according to the instructions in the first meeting, well, a questioner was set up uh, for stakeholders about the improvements. Uh, the, answer, the replies to the questioners were compiled and discussed, and uh, how uh, we had no time to give any recommendations. So during the session of the CSCD in May, it was requested to extend the mandate of the working group for, for another year. Uh, subsequently, uh, Frederick Reel resigned. He uh, uh, didn't want to continue, so I, I took over the chairmanship and uh, I think uh, it has been announced just before the uh, IGF in Nairobi uh, when I, I was uh, receiving some very nice words from the older participants so it really encouraged me to continue this work. So we had our third meeting in October uh, last year. I decided that well probably two days is not enough for a meeting, we should have at least three and the numbers of meetings I thought that it would be beneficial to have also three. So we had a third meeting in Geneva uh, where based on this questionnaire and this, a short compilation which was a joint work of a government representative and a representative of uh, academia, we uh, managed to go through and agreed five main points uh, to discuss. Uh, and the fourth meeting we discussed and agreed three main points and on the final meeting we agreed on the remaining points and drafted the recommendations. Uh, just uh, before I go to the agreed main topics I have to tell you that uh, the major enemy was the mistrust which disappeared. Fortunately it disappeared and uh, people accepted each other and people were treated on an equal footing, there was no distinction, everybody could propose something, it was discussed and we agreed on things on a consensual basis. Uh, consensus to me uh, generally means that the majority, but uh, well at that time it was a kind of un unanimous majority, uh, a unanimous uh, consensus. So basically uh, we uh, agreed on these five topics that is shaping the outcomes of the IGF meetings, working modalities including open consultations, the MAG and Secretariat. A very hot issue was the funding of the IGF. Number four was broadening participation and finally linking the IGF to other related processes, mechanisms and bodies. So, in this approach, uh, which was a multi-stakeholder approach, one of the principles we agreed on that we dis disconnect the working group from enhanced cooperation. There were no issues treated concerning enhanced cooperation. This might have been one of the uh, reasons for the success. 
uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we managed to build some kind of trust and there was a teamwork, a real teamwork. Uh, as for the agreed main topics, we have talked about that and we managed to have 39 recommendations. So uh, we ended up having a report. We submitted this report uh, with recommendations to the members of the working group and it was approved. Uh, just for the sake of history, uh, the report was submitted also to the CSCD uh, this year in May. It accepted it and there was a follow-up in New York in July during the ECOSOC, it was also presented and it was uh, accepted and it will be discussed, I think, uh, this week or next week during the UN uh, General Assembly. So, uh, the main points, the first point was shaping the outcomes of the IGF meetings. Uh, this was a kind of introductory uh, discussion and of course it was a kind of general consensus that we should develop more tangible, tangible outputs. Uh, we should improve the visibility of the IGF outcomes and its accessibility with enhanced communication tools. And finally the communication strategy and tools to making available the relevant documents to all the relevant stakeholders and the media. I think this is quite important because this is the starting point. Well, uh, during some discussions earlier, uh, I think yesterday we had some discussions with the newcomers and it was said that, well, eventually uh, some stakeholders couldn't, get, couldn't engage in the IGF because the first step is to go to the website and uh, if you go to the website, you, you, sometimes you don't really feel like navigating any further or you, do, you get lost and so on. It's a well-known thing, I think it's known by the Secretariat and uh, uh, I could see some uh, initiatives already in this direction to do something about that. But uh, naturally here we are talking a little, a bit more, uh, in fact much more about tangible outputs and uh, uh, make it available for the wide community and use uh, communication strategies uh, which are available for us. Uh, as for the working modalities, uh, the recommendations can, can be grouped into three points. Point number one was to improve the overall prep preparative process of the IGF and I believe there are already steps in this direction. Uh, the openness of the IGF preparative meetings is well known uh, and I believe the MAG meetings have been made available also to, to the public. So it has been opened up. Uh, recommendation number two, improve the structure and working methods of the MAG. Uh, probably uh, uh, this recommendation uh, wasn't taken into account in the constitution of the last MAG because it hasn't yet been approved. So uh, the constitution of the, of the existing MAG uh, is just reflecting the, the uh, uh, existing uh, methods. But naturally the working methods can be improved. And uh, recommendation number three, strengthen and expand the secretariat uh, with all the implications it may have, that is, uh, which will lead us to the Point number three, the funding of the IGF, which is a very serious problem. Uh, we have the fund trust and uh, we are all the time asking for vo voluntary contributions. Uh, as it happened, we were told that the uh, position of the executive secretary has not been filled because there was no, not enough money in the fund trust. Uh, probably this is a chicken and egg problem. Uh, uh, but probably you may com comment on that later on. 
so the recommendations also can be grouped into three points encourage increased voluntary financial contributions enhance accountability and transparency and finally acknowledge the host country's support and in-kind support from other countries organizations and the un Point number four was broadening participation and the capacity building. Well, here we have four main uh, points, expand and diversify participation, enhance measures for broader participations, improve online visibility and accessibility of the RGF, and finally enhance all stakeholders' understanding of the RGF and internet governance issues. Uh, just let me give you some comments on uh, number three uh, and especially accessibility since myself I'm involved in uh, the dynamic coalition on accessibility and I have had just a workshop finished uh, about it uh, there are improvements we can we can feel improvements right now physical accessibility is improving uh, compared to whatever we, we experienced in Kenya uh, or eventually in Vilnius uh, where the site wasn't always accessible uh, we have captioning we have transcripts uh, uh, we have remote participation which uh, which allows people with disabilities uh, uh, to participate in addition to other people who couldn't make it to, to the venue so basically getting back to the general problem broadening participation and capacity building was uh, a very important point finally linking the IGF to other IG related entities uh, here again we have three main points ensure the relevance and inclusiveness of the annual IGFs support enhanced communication and empower the MAG and the RGF Secretariat to consistent outreach. Uh, I believe uh, all of these recommendations uh, are, are extremely uh, relevant. Uh, and uh, in details you can see them in the report which is on the CSTD website. As I mentioned, the draft resolution on physics follow-up, including the results of the working group and open consultation on enhanced cooperation, uh, uh, was uh, drafted uh, last May. As I mentioned, it was approved by the ECOSOC and hopefully it will be approved without modifications by the General Assembly uh, next week. Uh, some words about implementation. Well, we have had 39 recommendations. Uh, we have no provisions for implementation. And personally, I really regret we uh, haven't thought of it or we haven't uh, dealt with it uh, extensively or we didn't uh, have time or energy. Uh, anyway, we have... Uh, have we have had implicitly tasks for the secretariat and the mag and i would like to propose now to the mag to create a working group to translate recommendations to actions uh, let me give you some uh, thoughts about that well the only body i can see which can be active and proactive in implementing these rep recommendations is the mag uh, we cannot expect anything from, uh, uh, not because uh, they are not competent, but uh, because of the, the capacity uh, of the Secretariat. I mean, th th there are extremely few, uh, so probably it, it comes back to the MAG to, to make steps to implement the recommendations. So in conclusion, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, for me, one of the main results was that it was a multi-stakeholder approach within a UN body and we could build a mutual trust. 
it was decoupled from the enhanced corporations and the results were within the mandate and I believe that we really made recommendations for the improvements. So once again I would go for the implementation, implementation and implementation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. So we have five point recommendations, and now what? So, well, the UNGN Assembly may discuss this and hopefully pass it. Uh, the real work is the implementation. Now, I'd like to invite any of the panelists to have your own reflections. Um, whoever comes first, Wolfgang? Yes. Short, please. Now, okay. Um, thank you very much. I think um, the working group was a very good experience. As uh, Peter has said, it was in a certain way for the United Nations an innovation because it was. It's not easy for an uh, intergovernmental body like the UN to deal with a multi-stakeholder group. Um, in the beginning, the plan was to have only governments in the group and only after protest from non-governmental stakeholders um, this was open and this was a right step in the right direction um, but this is really new territory for the United Nations it's not new territory for the groups which are here because we are practicing the multi-stakeholder model for more than 10 years but for the United Nations it was new and in so far you know that the process produced 39 recommendations um, it's a very encouraging moment that we are on the right track. So, but we, that's our, only the first steps and much more has to be done. Um, the title of this session is Quo Vadis IGF. And I want just to make two points. The first thing is we have to understand that the IGF is in a rather competitive environment. So that there are a lot of other places where you discuss similar issues. And there are lots of other organizations who think, okay, now the internet, that's a big issue for us. And so that you know, we will see more competition. Who gets, let, who is the place which has the legitimacy and the universal, universality where these issues of the future will be discussed? Um, it, we discuss a lot of, about Dubai here and the forthcoming ITU conference. But if you go to the planned agenda for the World Telecommunication Policy Forum in Geneva in May uh, 2013, then, you know, these are all the issues, you know, which are discussed also here. So I think we do not have a monopoly as an IGF to discuss these issues, but we should be aware that other organizations doing it. That means if the IGF does not the job correctly, then they will lose the momentum and others will take over. So it's up to the IGF, you know, to produce excellent results and to make clear this is the best place because here we have the multi-stakeholder environment. Another competitor will be the WSIS 10 plus process. You know, what comes out from this is also a little bit unclear. And there will be other organizations. So that means my first point is, you know, the IGF is in a competitive environment and if it does not produce what people expect then it will lose the momentum and will go to another place because there is a need for discussion. We have to discuss this. So, but be aware about this. And this brings me to the second question is the outcome. Um, after five, six years of discussion about outcomes, I think we have now to jump and to say, okay, we have to produce something. This is not a negotiation body, and it should remain a body which where not text is negotiated. But we need something concrete as an outcome and, 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 and a step forward so that people come to the next IGF and say, what we have achieved, what is the next step, what do we have to do? So, and in so far, I think the idea to um, um, give the MAC probably a greater role and saying, okay, you have probably the opportunity to create a working group and to push something forward, to, to have more instruments in the hand to push for something, is not such a bad idea. The MAC so far has no procedures, so it's untested, you know, whether it's, it's allowed or not allowed, so that means it will... Uh, this is in the hand of the, of the, of the MAC in the next meeting in February in Paris, you know, to 
to reinvent itself and to say, you know, do we have a, uh, something? I think the MAC is a very good body because it's multi-stakeholder and it has the legitimacy from the General uh, Secretary of the United Nations. So that means they have a certain legitimacy to act and they have to, um, you know, understand their role and they have to do something. Um, I don't know whether, you know, the... Um, uh, the problem of enhanced cooperation should be linked to this. And, and Peter was very clear in saying, you know, one of the success for the working group was that we could dislink it from the enhanced cooperation. But enhanced cooperation will come back and we have to find a channel, you know, how to, how to discuss this. Otherwise it will be discussed elsewhere. And it's better to discuss it in the IGF and the MAC than in the second committee of the General Assembly, which is not a multi-stakeholder body. So that means we have to be aware that there are alternatives for discussion. If the discussion produces results here, it's much better. Uh, if we have no results, it will go elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. I think, yeah, uh, Melvi, I saw, and Marcus, and then Parminde. In that order, is that okay? Thank you, Izumi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Um, it was a pleasure to participate in that working group, and uh, I had uh, two personal takeouts uh, from that experience. And uh, firstly, um, it was really the amount of contributions that we received uh, from across the stakeholder groups, which was really incredible. And I don't just want to refer to the official written contributions, but the unofficial ones which came during the process. And uh, it was really also the number of contributions which uh, made us uh, extend the mandate because we didn't really have enough time to go uh, through them. And I think that really reflected the interest that people had on the IGF. Uh, so um, when the UN ponders the continuation of the uh, IGF, uh, again, I believe that that's in, in 2015, uh, I think the only uh, reply is yes, just uh, based on, on the interest that people have on this forum. Uh, the second takeout that I had from the group was the dynamics of uh, the multi-stakeholder participation. Uh, the mistrust which uh, Peter referred to uh, stemmed partially from the fact that uh, the other non-governmental participants uh, were just invitees and we didn't really know if we would need to uh, start to negotiate on terms of reference to see what kind of participatory rights they would have. And uh, luckily, uh, finally, it was accepted that everybody would work uh, at equal uh, basis. And uh, the different stakeholders didn't uh, work in their own silos. We really uh, uh, composed groups uh, uh, on the basis of our own interests and, and where we wanted to contribute. Uh, so it was a really good uh, experience. And, um, and it was really alleviating to have the non-governmental actors there because the diplomats are used to certain uh, ways and, and modes of uh, drafting and negotiating and uh, it was really the non-governmental actors that brought us back to, uh, to reality we strayed too far. Um, so the multi-stakeholder approach is definitely the way to go if we want to also uh, achieve something in the future. Thanks, my brethren. Marcus? Yes, thank you. I would like to take a step back and, uh, well, first of all, look a little bit at the history. You will recall that back in 2009 we had a very broad-based consultative process on the IGF on whether or not to extend the mandate. And the consultation in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, was overwhelmingly positive. However, uh, there were some governments who put the finger on the identified weaknesses and uh, questioned whether that was actually the outcome of the uh, consultative process and wanted essentially also change the nature of the IGF. And here I think uh, this uh, working group on the improvement has historic merits that it confirmed in an intergovernmental setting the fundamentals, I would like to call it, of the IGF as a platform for dialogue with uh, non-binding 
outcomes in a multi-stakeholder setting. Uh, and the recommendations, uh, I think recommendation number one is the essential recommendation. Funding is the core of the matter. Many of the issues had been brought up, the ideas had been brought up, the annual meetings, the taking stock meetings. Yeah. Everybody who goes to an IGF meeting has brilliant ideas what could be done better, but the problem is, of course, the lack uh, or the limitations in funding, and as it was pointed out rightly, the secretariat is, is extremely small. Uh, so the idea to bring in, give more responsibility to the MAG, I think, is extremely welcome, but we should not forget that it is a voluntary uh, organization. The MAG has members that contribute their voluntary work and this has also limitations. But uh, going forward, uh, yes we have to look back and have to recall the very beginnings of the IGF which was very shaky, people a mm -hmm. so, little bit nervous, very could lead to and we're very clear insisting on the mandate uh, that it should, it's not a new organization. You remember the wording in the Tunis agenda. It carefully steers away from any word that might give the impression that we are creating a new organization. It calls on the Secretary General to convene a meeting, an annual meeting as a platform for dialogue. And we had these discussions. Then the dynamic coalitions were seen as a way to produce results. Uh, whether or not this has happened, I think sadly it has not happened, but already at the very beginning there were some who said we should set up working groups to carry out intercessional works, but others said no, that sounds too much like an organization and we are not supposed to create a new organization. But I think the times they are changing and the IGF has matured uh, and I think the collaboration has become much more open among participants. Participants actually talk to each other. They did not at the beginning. There are sometimes even shouting. Uh, issues that we could not discuss at the first meeting can now be discussed. And we held a meeting on enhanced cooperation, a one-day meeting on the first day. Uh, and that was considered to be impossible in the early days of the IGF. We also came to the conclusion that the IGF would be the best home to take this discussion forward because precisely as Wolfgang has said, it is a, offers a multi-stakeholder setting. And if we find other ways of producing what has been uh, called more tangible results, I think we are also, I think, more relaxed about looking at ways. And I thought at our meeting on Monday there was Bernadette Lewis, the Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunication Union. She said that the Caribbean IGF, they had actually made good uh, experience with adding a back-to-back -back meeting with industry when you look at practical solutions. So this could also be a model on how to come up with something people can take home with. But again, uh, you know, all the tasks you ask the Secretariat to do uh, depends very much on the availability of funding. Yes, of course, it would be great to improve the website, but if it's one person who has to do it as part of his regular job, it's not quite the same if you have a big organization uh, who has, I don't know how many people dealing with the website. And yes, uh, the IGF is in a competitive environment, for sure. But uh, I think uh, it is also, uh, and having changed my position, I see the IGF more from the outside now, and I see how important it actually is. And we really have to convince industry uh, to chip in more money. Governments have done, I'm sitting here next to the biggest donor to the IGF, Finland has contributed generously, but industry on the whole has not really come up with adequate funding. The internet community has uh, been fairly regular and steady, but yes, also the internet community should contribute more to the funding. But without funding, then, uh, you know, 
we risk to have a model that is not sustainable. Thank you very much. Sounds like we had a good exercise, but at the end of the day, money counts. Or Paminder, your turn, please. Could you? <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, difficult to go into uh, what should we do going ahead without going back to what I think we were trying to do with the IGF. And as Marcus said, and I agree, and Marcus said, have said it elsewhere, that IGF is a very path-breaking um, innovation. It's crucial not only to the future of Internet governance, but governance in many other areas in the information age. And therefore, excuse me to step back a little and uh, tell what we, our organization, and the groups we work with would want or would have looked uh, IGF to be. For us, IGF is uh, a new innovation in democracy and we call it version 3. Version 1 was when governments made their policies and that's it because they are elected and version 2 we say are uh, of participatory democracy was when governments would get people on their own terms to talk to them whenever they wish, if they wished, on an ad hoc manner and, and that was consultation. And I think IGF represents version 3 where there is an institutionalization of participative spaces outside the executive authority of the government uh, uh, in a manner that uh, like judiciary is separate from the government and auditing systems uh, in the, of the state are separate. The executive is not able to exercise influence on the participative spaces which are supposed to uh, inform policy and also act as check and balances. So uh, that's what I think uh, IGF should have been. Now whether IGF has being able to be that kind of a system and what did the working group do towards it uh, is uh, the framework in which I would put my submission here uh, today. And I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm um, more than a bit disappointed the way IGF has worked since it was formed and the inability of the working group given an express mandate to strengthen it uh, to not have really done the kind of things it was expected to do and further after the report has been uh, submitted for many months now of the IGA process itself to have not really taken note of much of what was recommended. I'm sorry trying to be I mean sounding pessimistic but I have a great belief both in democracy and a participative forum like IGF and I can only uh, say what my highest expectations and aspirations from it are and that would in that sense look to be in a language of pessimism of what has been achieved till now. I think a couple of things are important for this kind of a forum which I, I have been talking about now, just now. Uh, one is that it has to be open and inclusive and it should show that everybody is represented and it should specifically show that the underrepresented people, the marginalized people are disproportionately represented in that forum. I'm just coming from the main session on critical internet resources. There were 12 people on the panel four from the US, three from all developing countries put together. I go to many other UN forums, they make it a point that there would be a 50-50 from developing countries and developed countries, whatever be the case. You see here, you would find probably the representation isn't really that balanced. I would think Jim should have also been sitting here who was a member of the working group uh, from Africa uh, on, on, on this panel. So if you are not able to show in practice, and I don't see it in practice, that the representation has improved, are the marginalized section more represented? They aren't. And now you can go and see, uh, see all sessions and you can see the divisions and these things are important. Have you improved on the UN system? I'm sorry you haven't. There are many bad things about the UN system, but they get the, at least the nominal representations right and those matter. Second thing is funding. Every policy participation system has to be publicly funded. I know all of you guys in your own countries would not accept a policy participation system which is funded by companies who have interest in that policy making. And I hear all kind of views here that is private funding which would support and and kind of get keep the policy participation system going. I don't agree with it. It was a proposal from my organization. It was a proposal from India and many other countries that there should be public funding of IGF. Not only the group did not go for full public funding, they said there should be no demand for any public funding and I consider it completely uh, a wrong model going ahead in uh, our ideals of democracy and our future of democratic governance. 
that is the reason we don't have money today to have an executive coordinator. We don't have a secretary to support, so people kind of become so free for all. The more powerful can, you know, get together and start determining the directions of a system in the name of uh, being a public participative system. I think there are a huge amount of dangers, and I have a duty to say these very unpleasant things because I bring it from the people who feel strongly and I don't feel that I come to these forums to just to be pleasant to other guys because because I'm not at an evening cocktail party I'm doing a political duty to represent concerns of the people who strongly strongly feel uh, in in this manner and and this kind of duties uh, have uh, not been filled up and third thing of uh, a, a good participative system which is version 3 of democracy is that it should have clear linkages with policy making spaces its recommendations should authoritatively be sent to the systems which make policies and I don't know you guys may be very surprised that people multi stakeholder groups did not agree to do that they said there's no need for a group which is multi stakeholder to send its opinions to in an authoritative manner to the policy making bodies that this is the opinion of a multi stakeholder group why don't you do something about it a multi stakeholder group said no we don't think that is necessary a few governments like India and Brazil said we think it is necessary and these are the countries who today bracketed as being against multi-stakeholderism is the power of the media and the power of these kind of participatory spaces which can get captured and which I suspect uh, do get captured in these type of things. So these are the three things. The open, the representativeness of marginalized sections, the public funding and the And the third part uh, is whether uh, they have real links with the policy making spaces. All three were put on the table by our organization, by India, many other countries. Most developing, developed countries did not agree to those recommendations and it fell through, it didn't go through and, and that's the reason we don't have a very strong IGF. We are talking about working groups today, a working group of the MAG to take it forward. There was a strong position within the working group on IGF for MAG to form working groups on different subjects. This was again not accepted by the same people who are asking for working groups on enhanced cooperation and on taking forward uh, implementation. I think these questions have to be answered because a public forum is a place where people ask questions and there is an obligation for the other people to answer these questions. And I'm asking these questions again. I would ask those people who did not agree to these, uh, these recommendations inside the working group to tell why didn't they agree to these uh, recommendations and why they, after the group has closed, asking for the same things to be done on what they call as a self-organizing manner and which I think could be a means of capturing participative spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Pamin, and thank you all. Uh, now we'd like to open the discussion with the floor. Uh, of course, I know several respond, wants to respond. Jim? Yes. Could you introduce briefly? Thank you very much, uh, the moderator and the panelists. We have highly qualitative panelists. Uh, my name is Jimson Olufi. I had the privilege of being a member of the CSTD Working Group, uh, one of the five uh, business representatives uh, from Africa. Uh, in fact, that introduction really says something that uh, uh, in terms of participation, I came in from Africa. And uh, that was the first time I had the opportunity to be so exposed to the diplomacy and all the refineries and uh, and that made me to really underscore the importance of the multi-stakeholder model. And uh, really, uh, why uh, I, I say that uh, this model is very important, uh, which is contrary to what I say, is because of the effect. In fact, uh, it has enriched you know, the space, the democratic space, even in Nigeria, and in some, at least Nigeria, that I know I'm from Nigeria. So I could summarize indeed that uh, IGF has made very real progress. It has uh, really, uh, we can improve on it, and that's the work of the, the CSTD working group. Uh, in terms of funding, I, I can recall why many people say, uh, okay, maybe uh, public funding should not be there, because of fear of takeover, uh, which is what we are seeing today that uh, maybe in the guise of some treaty, you know, there will be some kind of restriction here and there, and we know it's real. We, we, for my part of the world, it's real. It's just of late that uh, the system has been opened up. In fact, we had our first real, real multi stakeholder IGF, national IGF in Nigeria. That was uh, September. 
other has been ramshackle and uh, hide and seek event but we continue to talk about opening it up and we had the very first multi-stakeholder private sector they observed the process this is, is a long journey we're in and i, uh, I agree with uh, my, my, my sister from uh, fina it's a long journey so we need to improve on it and uh, what uh, our chair in fact i need to really commend our chair he did a marvelous work of coordinating us together he diffused the tension he made us to, to work you know to listen to ourselves and uh, we find out that even from business we we're able to now relate with some government easily and so some uh, roadblocks were removed so thanks to him and uh, now he's proposing that perhaps mark can take this up yes that's what we're discussing we can we can need to discuss but i can tell you igf is a success story is totally successful it's funding is important we need to look away talking about uh, public sector fund is given comes like Finland uh, contribute there are countries that make contribution but for the UN to now say to budget specifically that could give room to some uh, some interest group to take it over as we, we are seeing that, that is the concern so um, but by and large uh, I believe uh, we uh, uh, making progress, the openness uh, gives us opportunity, gives people like me the opportunity to be there. We can deepen the participation. There are many interests groups that still need to participate. We can enlarge it, even within the organization itself. And uh, there are many people that are taking a lot of things out of the idea. So there is a lot to take out, and uh, I'm here to take out the, uh, a lot of things, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Yes, uh, I will take a few more and then come back to the panel. And then go back to the floor. You first, and then. Thank you, Azumi. My name is Marilyn Cade. I too was one of the five business representatives who uh, participated in the um, CSTD working group. And I guess I'd like to say, from my perspective, uh, looking at this, I really want to say to everyone in this room that having the working group at the CSTD was absolutely vital and that although there were many MAG members who wanted to engage in uh, self-analysis and self-improvement I think that in fact that would have been a failure and I was very concerned that the MAG was um, uh, and the community within um, the stakeholders of which I consider myself one would think that we could both do our job of building and supporting the IGF and also engage in truly critical self-examination, which I think we needed to do. Um, others have spoken about our journey uh, over two years of getting to a really good, um, I think, consensus report um, on many things, not on all things, as Parmender has mentioned. But I'm going to say a couple of things from my perspective, in particular about funding, because um, I suspect I was one of the people um, that uh, may have been referenced. Um, I, th I think we need to make a distinction between putting something into the UNGA budget, which was at the time facing a 3 to 5 percent across the board budget cut, and accepting money from governments as we do today into the UN Donors Fund to make a significant co contribution to the funding of the IGF. And that is public funding. Because any money that a government collects, as far as I know, very few of them run competitive businesses. Most of them collect money via taxes, put it into a pool, and call it government funding. <laughs> so far. Um, being just a little humorous. Um, but the, the thing that I don't want to be humorous about is the significant need now for uh, rapidly increasing the funding base for the IGF from all sources. The funding base from more governments as donors with unencumbered funding contributions. And I think that's one of the real values that the government contributions bring is the assurity that everyone can have that that is coming in an unencumbered way. Funding from businesses at an appropriate representative and deeper base, but also understanding that people may bring concerns about financial sponsorship from business. So let's make sure that money comes as a contribution without encumberment. 
no advertisements, truly unencumbered funding. And putting it through the UN Donors Fund, to me, provides a real safeguard, and I am a big fan of that. Other businesses complain about the complexity, and I am a champion of still using that model. The, I, the Internet societies and technical groups are making significant contributions. I'd like to see more CCs, more of the country code, TLDs, making financial sponsorships. And I'd like to see diversification of funding coming from um, such entities as, for instance, um, I could think of companies who are using the Internet, but not running it. But the funding has got to be a big priority. Finally, I'm just going to say one word about the implementation of the report. I'm not a big fan of the MAG implementing the improvements. I'm a big fan of the Secretariat driving the implementation of the improvements and using resources from the uh, group of stakeholders, which should include the MAG but not be limited to the MAG. But I think we have to empower the Secretariat to drive the uh, implementation of the report. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ayman Sherbini. I'm uh, uh, one of the co-founders of the Arab Internet Governance Forum, uh, representing the United Nations, which is a joint umbrella with uh, the League of Arab States. Uh, I just have some uh, reflections uh, and uh, maybe some questions, especially uh, that uh, I am so, uh, one of the supporters and active participants in the process uh, globally, uh, plus uh, we have been leading this on the Arab level. Uh, I share part of the pessimism of uh, my colleague from uh, India, but I would like to ask him to make things more uh, concrete and realistic. I mean, wh what is in his opinion uh, is actually uh, hindering uh, the public funding of the IGF? I mean, what is really the, uh, missing? What is, where is the missing link that uh, prevents governments from doing uh, the uh, uh, supposedly uh, responsible funding for such a process? Uh, I mean, this is something that we have to ponder on a little bit. I mean, uh, is there a problem on conveying the benefits of the process of the dialogue to the, the governments? Or, uh, uh, I mean, they are interested in other processes uh, that uh, Wolf Gunn has mentioned, that we are not working in vacuum. So uh, we need to think about uh, where is the missing link uh, from the point of view of governments that uh, might be uh, filled and therefore uh, bring them into the bank wagon. The other point uh, that I share also uh, on the uh, practical side with my colleague from uh, uh, the USA is uh, that uh, I would like to see the Secretariat more uh, uh, empowered. I'd like to see it uh, uh, in a way or another more staffed and uh, have a stronger mandate on uh, the leadership level. And uh, uh, I have to admit that it is not my idea, but I, it, I got it from her also. I like the idea of strengthening the GA role in funding or streamlining the budget uh, to uh, the Secretariat since uh, this is uh, uh, probably uh, and it should be as a started a UN uh, spin-off and uh, I don't see a reason why uh, not institutionalize it in a certain way of course a uh, soft hand approach but at least to make sure that there is a certain money uh, uh, or what we call in the UN regular budget mechanism for financing the what we call also the regular posts and such things uh, in UN jargon, this is so-called extra-budgetary activity. XB is not sustainable. And uh, that's why you are totally, totally right when you are uh, feeling awkward about the source of funding coming from the business or supposedly from the public or the governments as a proxy to the public. I mean, if it is more institutionalized and getting more into the core of the business as usual, modus operandi of the UN, I think it can be more sustainable when they have regular budget, posts, and this should go through a GA uh, mechanism uh, as, uh, as any other organization uh, or a unit in the UN. doesn't mean that it has to be or that bureaucratic as other units, but at least uh, securing finance for long term. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd like to go back to the panel if you have any say. And Marcus and Paminda indicated in that order. And then Melvi. Mel Mel and then after hearing from the panel, I'll return the microphone to the audience um, or participants or our members. And Sam wants to talk. So Marcus now. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I, 
have a word or two to say about the funding. Uh, looking back to at the mandate, it was clear that this was not a regular UN body, and we had UN lawyers looking at the mandate and saying, well, yes, it is and it is not, but it was clear this cannot be funded through the regular budget based on that mandate. If you want to fund it through the regular budget, then you need to change the mandate. Yes, the General Assembly is free to do so. The General Assembly is the supreme organ and they can say, okay, it will now be funded through the regular budget if they agree. Uh, yes, it has been uh, funded through an extra budgetary, it, it is an extra budgetary project and yes, this makes it very shaky. I was actually working for the Secretariat, as you may know, and I had in what less than five years, I think, had 17 contracts. The shortest one was for one month, and I think one was for one year. But just to say, this is very shaky if it's through extra budgetary resources. But we have managed to bring it up to a level that made it possible to go forward. Now, question, should it be change the model? Should it be put into the regular budget of the United Nations, which would be a political decision? Uh, the government of Brazil actually approached me, that was shortly before the meeting in Rio, said should we in the resolution put in regular budget for the IGF? I then said yes, that would of course be lovely having a regular sustainable uh, <laughs> contract, but it tends to be politically divisive and actually then the contacts I had with the Brazilian government agreed at the time. It usually is a very divisive issue if membership asks for a new activity to be put into the regular budget. And well this is, you know, it's a meta issue. This is nothing to do with the IGF. This is whenever a new activity is put on the agenda, there is the question, can the UN shift priorities. I heard Kofi Annan once say at one of his townhouse meeting, town hall meetings he gave to regular uh, to UN staff in Geneva, he said he has in his remit, I think, to shift, I think, up to 50 staff within a year from one division to another. But lo and behold, if he tries to shift one staff, people knock on his door, ministers, ambassadors, and it is as if World War III would break out. He has never been able to do anything. And this is, the UN has an inability to change priority within an organization. You know, in theory, it should be possible that you say, this old activity is not relevant anymore, but the internet is relevant, okay, let's make this a priority. But this is a lost battle in advance. And the big contributor to the UN budget, they will never, 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 and never, ever agree to give more money to the budget of the United Nations. They say if it has to be financed to the regular budget, fine with us, but show us where you cut instead, where you shift resources. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is just a, a political issue. It's a political fact. Uh, you may wish to ignore it and fight for it, fine. You know, Don Quixote find, fought against windmills, but it will not yield any result. And now, the trust fund mechanism is a well-established mechanism in the UN context. It is, uh, they, uh, there is a firewall between what donors can do to influence, they have no influence whatever, it is administered by the United Nations. As Marilyn said, maybe a little bit cumbersome as the, uh, we have to sign an agreement with the United Nations. Governments are used to that, but private companies are not. But we are also looking into ways of making this, maybe finding a more flexible way that would allow companies to make contributions in an easier manner. But, okay, I could go on and on and on on this, but this is, a, I think we have to accept certain facts of life and uh, yes, appeal on donors to contribute more. And actually, MAG members can also be very helpful. The MAG is like a board, and the board usually has a responsibility of helping with fundraising. So I would see this also as a 
important activity. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And now, Paminda. Okay. Um, the many issues, and I, I, I take. IGF to be a very big experiment, so all issues are very important, but I would only be able to speak of one or two. All of them are linked, and I, as I said, take it as a new wave of democracy so you can understand how many big issues are involved. But it's good to be concrete and deal with a few, uh, at least in this intervention. First, the issue of gym. I think you have to think a bit about it. It's very easy to mention capture by governments in this system here. But it's very difficult to mention captured by private sectors. Now, there is a disbalance here. I'm a civil society organization in India. Daily fight captured by governments of all spaces. I think but sense of balance is not to be lost. Capture doesn't come only from one side. Capture can as easily and at the global level, I can assure you, more easily come from the private sector, especially in the Internet space. Now, this both captures any meeting which is speaking of the both captures in a balanced manner, I will be there. But I have been here in the IGF for many days, many IGFs, and for two days here. We can talk government capture. And the kind of capture I talk, it looks like a uh, rabid view, you know, disruptive stuff. And I just get the balance right. Within your own country, would you agree, and I have had this fight in India, that we are trying to make an education policy, and there's a forum for giving suggestions on the education policy. It's got Microsoft and digital content companies all funding that forum. Very distinctively, when I talk to people, they said, no, we wouldn't accept it. And why do you want to accept it for the global level? And I haven't got an answer for this. And if people have an answer, I'm ready to engage with that answer. So for me, global democracy is as sacrosanct as my democracy in my country. So that's the answer number one. To the specific issue of funding. Now, you were wrong that Marilyn was supporting an institutionalized UN fund. She said she's the one who opposed it within, within the working group. And I'm right in uh, saying that. And most of the people in the working group clearly opposed uh, money from the UN being institutionalized. We supported, India supported as a country, I as an IT for change NGO. But they said no. And they said not only most of the fund should come from there, no fund should come from there because of the capture issue. But suddenly we lose the perspective that Google funding IGF would also be a capture and that capture doesn't figure in our, our, our thinkings and people say it is really a neutral fund which does not have an implication on how IGF goes forward the donor trust fund the chair said just now that it's become a chicken and egg story if you don't become effective you don't attract funds now what's being effective is effective for certain kind of funders and that's the disjunction which we need from funders and policy making People openly say funds is not being attracted and IGF has to show effectiveness. Now, effectiveness is a very loaded term. Effectiveness for what and for whom? And then what kind of funds it would be attracted? This doesn't work in democratic systems. And, uh, and, and the question whether government funds are public funds. Now, if government of US or government of uh, Holland gives funds. No, in a way, they are public, but in a way, they are not. And I'll give you an example of, and I'm getting there, Marilyn, and you will agree with me. In India, there is a committee which decides allocation of the central tax pool to the states. Now that committee were to take suggestions from everywhere and we say the state gives funds to it and the states can give fund and it survives on the funds of the states. The committee which determines allocation to the states. Now we wouldn't consider the funds from the states to be uninterested funds because the bigger states who want to take big money to, for that committee which decides allocations to the states. In that sense, states become an interested stakeholder for that committee. The fund has to be at a public level which is higher than the participating interested stakeholders. In that sense, the funds from countries, it is not at the same level as UN funding, which is a global public. Global public, national publics, subnational publics, local publics, there's a hierarchy of publics. Last point of Marcus, and this is also the way we conveniently move between what is aspirational and idealistic and what is practical. When we have to tilt at the windmill of multi-stakeholderism or intergovernmentalism, we put our aspirations here. Isn't Kofi Annan shocked by the fact that multi-stakeholderism is not a regular thing in the UN? Now you are trying to shake many bigger pillars 
of the UN by promoting multi-stakeholderism in which I am with you, but that time we don't think about what is not okay to shake in the UN system because we are civil society or we are the groups who want big changes. Information society is about big changes. We want multi-stakeholderism where UN has not done in 50 years. But when we talk about public funding, we go to the small operational pragmatic issues about what would be difficult and 50 people can't be transferred more than 50 people in a state. Now that kind of hierarchy between pragmatism and idealism is also depending on what ideologies we hold and what we really want uh, to be done and I completely disagree that there's anything in the Tunis agenda which says that UN cannot fund the IGF. The, the language of Tunis agenda, please read it. The summit instructs the Secretary General in the third quarter of 2006 to convene a forum. Do you expect the summit uh, to ask a secretary general to convene a forum out of his own pocket? This is the line of the summit. The line of the summit means, yes, I know it. Whenever you have in any UN system, there are political directions and after the political direction is made, funding has to always go to a different process. It is true of Indian government as well. Any ministry can say there will be a scheme for uh, all schools to get computers. And then there's a next decision at a financial level, which allocates that money. So yes, this summit decision has to be supported by the first committee's uh, decision on finance, but does not say, and this is a wrong interpretation, that the Tunis agenda says that IGF cannot be funded by the UN. And I think Marcus wants to say something on yeah, it. Yeah, well, you. before that, sorry, because um, 30 seconds for you and 60 seconds for Marcus. And then Sam. Just a, a reflection of what Parmida said, uh, not now, but in the previous intervention about the slowness of the uh, um, UN system. Yes, we knew that the, if we are in the UN system, that it takes some time to, to approve, to go through to some committees, to, through some ECOSO, and finally the GA, and we cannot do anything about it. This is the way it is working. The other thing, um, uh, concerning uh, uh, MAG involvement in the implementation, uh, the recommendations give the what, what we should do, uh, but it doesn't say how we should do. So it's time to think about that. It was an idea to involve uh, MAG because I couldn't think of anything else, but if you have better suggestions, of course, every, everyone is open to that. So whatever way you think is more valuable, and more efficient to put this into practice. But the only thing I want to emphasize, we have to do something. Marcus? Just on the funding, I mean, yes, it doesn't say explicitly the IGF shall not be funded through the regular budget, but it, the wording has been diplomatically negotiated and it's clear that it's not part of the regular UN program. Money doesn't grow on trees. It is distributed in the various divisions of the UN, in the various programs. And there, there is no link from the Tunis agenda which would give any inkling as from where the money would come. And there is a tradition in the UN context that these sort of loose mandates that are not enshrined in the UN structure, and it does not say to the United Nations, it says to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Yes, obviously he's not supposed to pay out of his own pockets, but then you have this mechanism for extra budgetary funding through voluntary contributions, and they're part of the UN budget. They're administered as a, public, a publicly administered budget. Now you are seeing the, some of the discussions or debates we had inside the working group, uh, but I'd like to hear some outside voices and then go come back to, if I may. Hi, I'm Sam Dickinson. I was one of the five technical representatives on the uh, CSTD working group. Um, I'd like, just like to give my thoughts, as I think I'm the only tech member here in the room from that working group. Um, what I found very important about the CSTD Working Group was that it showed that multi-stakeholderism, which uh, the IGF and the internet ecosystem are based on, works. Uh, we changed the UN a little when the, U uh, the IGF was created and we changed the UN a little more with the creation of this successful working group. Compare this worky, uh, the working method of the multi-stakeholder working group to the CSTD 
session in May where the government only debates about how to draft, how to go forward with the enhanced cooperation process, reached a stalemate. Um, also, in terms of the fact that um, Paminda felt that not all of the issues were resolved in the group um, and that people changed their position or didn't, weren't consistent between when they started and when they ended, um, I'd just like to remind everyone that the internet evolves constantly. Um, our environment uh, changes constantly and all stakeholder views should change as well in response to those changes. So I think the fact that stakeholders change their opinions is an uh, something that we should embrace. We embrace the fact that governments at the start of this process had um, sometimes rejected the multi-stakeholder model. We're not criticising them for that, we're telling them that they're fantastic. So we should also embrace other stakeholder groups for um, embracing flexibility. That's all. Being faced with these kind of challenges is something that's very exciting and interesting, being a member of the working group now. Thank you, Zumi. Uh, and uh, thanks again for the first round of uh, uh, comments on uh, the ideas. I would like to pick on some key words. The word uh, by the Mr. Chair of the working group that something has to be done and the idea between pragmatism and idealism and uh, the realities and constraints that Marcus have said. So, I mean, building on all of that, let us really get out of uh, this story by some practical option for moving forward. I mean, we cannot afford to see this uh, kind of constraint sustained over years. It is really weird sustainability of the constraint sustainability of the financial uh, dilemma of the IGF. I mean, how can we live with that? We have to get out of that beyond the discussions with a practical notion of moving forward. I I'd like to share my perspective as a senior officer and chief in the United Nations that ch things change. And this is building also on the word of uh, our colleague there, a technical community member. Things change. I mean, we can move from the XB paradigm to the RB paradigm. And this is what I have done in my work program uh, for uh, uh, the organization I'm representing, which is the United Nations ESQA. It used to be financed such activities from XB, and I, I worked with my colleagues, and the colleagues worked with me in planning to move it into RB. So, I mean, we can work on that. Maybe it's too tedious because of the GA, CSTD, ECOSOC, all these processes. But if we share the same notion, let's plan to do that in the next two years. I mean, by the end of 2014 or 2015, by the WSIS Plus 10 or whatever, on a high-level summit, we move this activity from XB to RB. This is doable, and I've been working in the UN more than a decade now, and this takes time, but it is doable. Let us, if we support this notion, use it as an anchor for hope, moving this XB into RB because it is sustainable, it is useful, it is required, and I think this is the only way forward out of this uh, uh, tunnel. Thank you. I see Jim want to respond, but anybody else who hasn't spoken yet, who is sort of wondering to take the floor or not? Okay, if not, then Jim. XPRB sounds like the Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Zumi. Uh, just one comment and a question to Sin. Um, I want to uh, comment that uh, I'm from small business community. I run a small business and uh, if if not for the multi-stakeholder and uh, the diversity of the, the business community i won't be part of it so i think we're making progress you know so i recognize what you said that uh, the big players of microsoft cisco you know when you call private sector in africa for example they know they go shop this we need to we need to improve on that yes they have legitimate right because they have local employees that are working there. So the idea is that everybody should be involved and we're making progress. Then the question I want to ask is this. Well, uh, maybe in tandem with what Sam so mentioned about change, uh, I was really thrilled to see changes in the Indian government position on IG. So perhaps uh, maybe it's due to your work and what have you, can you enlighten me, for example, how that happened? Because it was a dramatic change. Because we know Indian government was at the forefront of, uh, you know, this thing. We are trying to say, no, government should not take over. And uh, now it's a change that uh, the most involved. So I'm really interested in getting that story. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I'm, I'm sorry, you're Jameson, not Jim. I, I had some wrong impression and stuff. So sorry. Um, but 
I think we have only a few minutes to wind up, and uh, we'll have some long lunch queue. <laughs> so I'd like to ask all the panel to have some last words about way forward, Kuo Valdis. Not do Dominus, but yourself. Answer the question, please. Uh, 60 seconds each, maybe more, maybe less. Wolfgang. Yes, you know, I always, I disagree with Parminder on a, not, a lot of issues, but also agree with him on a number of other issues and going beyond financing and going back to more substantial issues and, you know, how to organize the future. I think he's absolutely right when he said, you know, we have to be more careful in um, giving, making the IGF really universal. So if I go through through the panels, you see really a recycling of more or less the same person sitting on the same panel and talking the same things in different settings. So um, while certainly the value of the old guard, of the old veterans of the IGF is there, they can bring something to the table, the history. But the IGF should be a, a platform where we bring also unknown faces more to the public. Um, where we bring the next generation to the public, uh, where we bring people who have not yet been involved in this discussion, so you know, have a chance to express themselves what they expect that we can learn from the people who are outside this flying circus and you know want to join, that they are the drivers of the future. And I think this is really important that the next mark thinks you know if they, you know populate the various um, uh, um, uh, plenaries and workshops are more sensitive, that they have more young people and more people from, from countries who are not represented. You know, I'm missing here, for instance, you know, one big internet nation, China. There was no plenary speech from China. We see only little Chinese speakers. I would be interested, you know, to hear more about what China is doing with the Internet of the future. Thank you. Thanks, Wolfgang. Who's next? Okay. Uh, Melvi? Uh, thanks, uh, Izumi. Just briefly on the lack of funding. Um, it really is a complex issue, and I think it requires different approaches and actions. Um, and one of the challenges really is that there may be money available, but there is no possibility to channel it for one uh, reason or another. Uh, it may be that the UN rules prohibit or limit certain kinds of transactions, and also the donors themselves have different requirements uh, and expectations. Um, and it really takes a considerable amount of resources, both from the Secretariat and, and the donors themselves, to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, delete those hurdles. And at the moment, I think we have this kind of a chicken and egg situation that we don't have the key positions uh, filled uh, so that we would have those resources available in, in the Secretariat. So I, I really hope that they, they would be filled very soon. Um, and then on the future, um, the UN General Assembly is about to make a decision on the recommendations as we speak uh, when they uh, draft the uh, yearly annual uh, ICT for Development uh, resolution. Uh, and hopefully they will appro approve the, uh, the recommendations and uh, it would be very helpful if you know uh, your representative uh, in, in those negotiations to get in touch with them and, and ask them for a strong support for the recommendations and for the future of the IGF. Uh, hopefully the General Assembly will also give some overall guidance on how to implement the recommendations, but at the same time nothing impedes uh, the MAC from uh, drafting uh, a plan of action on how to do that. Whether it will be a smaller working group or just the MAG uh, itself, I don't know, but uh, we, we have to take some kind of coordinated uh, action uh, to realize them. Thank you. Um, Marcus? Well, basically, I've indicated sp spoken too much already, but uh, I think to pick up on Wolfgang and also Parminda's comments, uh, that we have to take seriously, that the panels, uh, basically the guidelines are they should reflect diversity and looking at this panel, yes, it's the same old faces and we really should make an effort collectively and what Paminda said about the panel on critical internet resources clearly 
this is not particularly balanced. So this is really something, and that's the responsibility of the mag. The mag should really enforce with an iron fist this rule that the panels should reflect diversity. Thank you. Paminda? Yeah, before I come to what should, where should we go ahead from here, I have to answer the question Jim asked coming from a developing country and what does a small business for me? 30 seconds. Uh, important constituency. No, there's a direct question. I have to answer the question. I'm sorry, moderator. Uh, and what should be done? I, I think we need to improve the multi-stakeholder processes, but we cannot lose sight of the larger structural issues because to get a small gain, we may lose a bigger gain. Nobody is saying multi-stakeholderism or not. We are saying multi-stakeholderism, which kind of, what kind of public support processes support is needed. I mean, I have asked, uh, faced the same question again. Do you want the internet or not when they talk about internet governance? No, I, there isn't one kind of internet. There are different folks. There can be different methods of uh, multi-stakeholderism or internet, and we want the best one. So don't lose idealism just because we are getting something. So if we if we stop talking about the bigger issues about what kind of multi-stakeholderism, we lose it. Uh, and my dear friend talked about changing views. Everybody has a right to change views, but when they're asked questions in a public forum about what happened in six months, they have changed views, they need to answer that. Indian government also needs to answer that and you to ask them all the time. But not to answer this question is a indication of your power. And I have repeated last this question and people don't answer this. Third, we have to go forward. I'm very happy with IGF or MAG going forward. I used to say in the early years that MAG should go forward. The same guy said, no, it is a program committee. Don't touch it. It wouldn't do these kind of things. It's fine. Is it that there is a certain kind of captures taking place now that they are more comfortable and I'm inversely less comfortable about it? I'm sorry to say I feel that the representativeness of the IGF and MAG has not moved in that direction, which may gives me comfort to say, yes, it should take. Improve your representation first. Look like it represents the world's opinion. And yes, then these are the kind of forums who should take forward all these kinds. But right now it is going in the negative direction. The MAG, the IGF's constitution, the panels, the kind of reports. I was there in enhanced corporation meeting yesterday. The whole room seems to keep on saying there seems to be a consensus. There seems to be a consensus. I had a campaign where like 80 organizations and 100 people supported a very different concept of what enhanced cooperation should be there. There were nobody in the room there. And the room says there is a consensus that makes me uncomfortable. So yes, change the nature and representativeness of the IGF. And then IGF should do more things. Thanks. And last but not least. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would like to follow up what Mervis said. Uh, yes, we do need your support, the government support uh, in the GA uh, upcoming meetings to to have the recommendations accepted. Yes, we know that uh, there are ways, different ways to do things, uh, but we should go ahead. And uh, uh, maybe the mag is not the ideal body, but this is the only body we can see right now. So, Thank you. Um, just a few seconds for me, <laughs> if I may. Uh, there's J Chinese or Japanese saying, one bet, two different dreams. The couple share the bet, but they have different dreams, whether it's good or bad. Like multi-stakeholder, um, we all agree that it's a good thing, but do we have the same similar uh, expectation together? Or sometimes we have some different expectations under the same sort of framework. That's where the difficulty is. To, I feel like uh, listening to all the wonderful um, interventions about funding or w where to go. Um, but I think what's good about it is we have one bet. We're sharing the platform. Of course, it's not su sufficient. I agree totally with Paminder, and this MAG hasn't really done the kind of job we want to do. There are several reasons I wouldn't go into details. But in, in any case, I think we see the very positive energy from Paminder and others to try to make it carry forward uh, to the right direction. With that, thanks, everyone. This workshop is closed. <laughs>